prayed about it, but most of you probably haven't heard. Elder Jeffrey can give you more of the details, but uh, the basement at the house on the, in the church property was flooded uh, like, like a lot. Uh, and it was, who knows how long it was going, but the water was just running and running and running. Thank God uh, that the, there was nothing set on fire because there was electrical stuff that was live underwater in the basement, and we went there on Wednesday night for the prayer meeting, and we went, there was something running, we didn't know what it was, thought it was the water pump, and we go to the basement, and the water's all the way up to the top of the stairs, so we couldn't even get in, um, and so that was, led to an interesting night for Elder Jeffrey, for sure, but uh, thankfully there was no fire or anything like that, the power was shut down, and we got the water out, and then the cleanups would be pretty significant, so we didn't have teams group, there was no power, it was kind of a disaster over there, but hopefully this next week it'll be back up and run it. So just wanted to let you know about that. Please pray for that and pray with Thanksgiving that everything was okay. Could have been a whole lot. Could have burnt down very easily with electricity and water and all that. Uh, just uh, very quickly, how many of you went on uh, the Week of Hope trip? Woohoo! It was amazing. Uh, filled with some fun, some drama, and uh, some change. Some what? Some southern accents, yeah. There was a group from Kentucky and a group from Tennessee. I, I just felt right down at home. I mean, it was just fine for me. I don't know. Some of y'all don't know uh, what that's all like. It was, it was just fine for me. So we had crews and uh, teens and our adults, and they. Oh, ah, sorry. Uh, anyway, and uh, some of the things that we did included working uh, with the elderly. Some of our team worked with the elderly. Some worked at the church property, and so the team was supposed to be at another church. Last minute that fell through, so we were at this church that is a uh, kind of a restoration project. So it was an old church that basically had died. This young couple came in and uh, was trying to rebuild, and uh, they, they only had still about 60 people, but it was, it's a big church, a big facility, the nice sanctuary. It's older, and so some of the crews, I think uh, uh, Peter's crew, if I remember correctly, was working there and being a blessing uh, to them. Uh, let's see, what else? Uh, we worked in parks. Uh, some of our crews saved the Chesapeake Bay. And so if you ever eat crabs out of Chesapeake, we, we helped save that. I see Howard's not in here, but Howard and I, our crews worked together, did this project. That, uh, it's kind of like these new neighborhoods build these natural Brita filter systems in all of the water runoffs. And that water runoff goes into then the Potomac eventually, and the Potomac empties out into the Chesapeake, and that filters all the garbage and the junk. And uh, it was kind of cool to be a part of saving the Chesapeake Bay. So we really made an impact in our in our world. Uh, we did a lot of other projects. We cooked, we cleaned, we played a lot of cards, a lot of basketball, uh, some soccer. Some of us kayaked and boat. There was an emergency rescue. Uh, Chris is not here, but he's not here. He's okay. He's at uh, another camp. He had to be rescued. It was awesome. Uh, I wish I had more pictures here for you, but uh, there was crazy hat day. And so uh, that was pretty fun. Love some pictures of that up on the website and different things. We had devotions uh, three times a day in God's Word. And uh, we were a part of both being repaired and repairing people's lives in the physical world. And uh, what, a, what a joy and honor to be a part of that. Uh, it's great to serve others in need, isn't it? I mean, when you get to, when you get to really make an impact in, people, in people's lives that, that need it, uh, it's very rewarding. You know, living selfishly, getting the things that we want, you know, that's only very temporary at best, but really impacting people is awesome. And so I just want to encourage all of us to make that part of our day-to-day -day lifestyle, that we really live to help other people. And so speaking of daily day-to-day -day lifestyle, God wants to speak to us through His Word this morning. If you have a copy of the Bible, we're going to be in the book of Ephesians. We're wrapping this up in the next few weeks. We'll have some of the verses on the screen as well, hopefully, God willing. Uh, it's summer, and so all kinds of demons get in our stuff during the summer. So hopefully we'll have it for you. But God does want to speak to us, and if you will listen to what God wants to say, not so much my words, but what God wants to say, you'll have the tools that you need. Okay, think about this. You'll have the tools that you need to live your day-to-day -day life with spiritual strength and power. Uh, who wants that? I mean, I want that. I need that. In the song that we sang, you know, Bless the Lord, I'm a song, and, and in that day when my strength is failing. I mean, that's like every day, kind of. At least there's parts of almost every day where we feel weak 
uh, not just physically weak, but we feel spiritually weak. So the Apostle Paul used to be a tormentor of the church. The blood of, of Christians was, was spilled at his, in his, under his authority. He hated Christians. Uh, he begins the conclusion of the letter that he wrote to the church at Ephesus. And, and he, this is kind of like the church constitution. I think if you only had, thanks Dave, if you only had one book of the whole Bible, if you just had one book to live on, you know, the Gospels would be important, obviously, seeing the life of Christ. But I think if you just had the book of Ephesians, there's enough about Jesus in the first three chapters, and there's enough about how to live in the second three chapters, the last three chapters, that you could live your entire Christian life just with this book. And he emphasizes here at the end, God's rich resources. Not just like for a church meeting and, and to have some things that for Christians to do, but so that you can and I can live our day-to-day -day life with real direction. Christians grow in spiritual strength by using God's resources. That's why we so often feel so weak and incapable because we're trust we're trying to live this certain kind of way of life. We're trying to live this lifestyle, but we're not utilizing God's resources. This is important because the church, which is the body of Jesus, right? Really, that metaphor is just uh, really the foundation. That metaphor is built in the Book of Ephesians. Is at war with a real spiritual enemy. We don't just walk, right? He emphasizes this in chapter 4, 5, and 6. This walk, this, this the lifestyle, right? We don't just walk, we war. We are at war. Pastor Warren Wearsby, probably never heard of him, but uh, wrote some books and, and was uh, influential in Laura and I's early Christian life. He famously said this, Sooner or later, every believer, every Christian, discovers that the Christian life is... Click. Under the leg. Oh, am I on? On. You're on. Yeah, I'm on. Awesome, thank you. It's a battleground, not a playground. So often, we, you know, we come to church, this, the Christian lifestyle, it's like a, it's like a play. What do, you, what do you do at a playground? Well, hope, you, you play. Yeah, you, you play, or hopefully for everyone in here, you watch kids play. Uh, you know, maybe you play, depending on the, the size of the playground. But at any rate, according to the book of Acts, uh, I'm trying to blank it. Oh, there we go. Awesome. Thanks, guys. According to the book of Acts and other sources, so we're trying to we're trying to discern what is the context in which Paul is writing. Well, we learn that there was an unusual amount of demonic activity in Ephesus, and Paul encountered it when he ministered there. So let me let me highlight that for you in the book of Acts. I'll just read to you, starting in verse 13. Uh, this is the context for the, the book of Ephesus. Some Jews went around driving out evil spirits. And they tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. They would say, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. Okay, so this is, you know, this is going on quite a bit. One day, the evil spirit answered them, Jesus, I know, and I know about Paul, but who are you? I mean, I don't know what it sounded like, but it's probably something scary like that, right? Then a man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. I mean, this is like, you know those like horror movies, which I just cannot watch. This is it. You know, this is real. This like actually happened. Verse 17, when this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear. The name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. Many of those who believe now... Uh, came and openly confessed their evil deeds, and a number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. And when they and then on and on. Okay, so there was a lot of this going on. There's a lot of other uh, extra biblical uh, in, uh, materials that talk about this kind of demonic, this real spiritual war. So it was appropriate then that, that Paul, as he wrote this letter to the church, he addressed the subject at some length. And so from verse 10 to the end of the book, the end of the chapter here, he addresses this spiritual warfare. That's what we're going to begin to talk about. But note, before we get into the, the text this morning, that the Bible was not given uh, just to be filling our minds with more information. The Bible was given to enable followers of Jesus to face life in a practical way realistic way. Jesus didn't care much for the Sabbath regulations of his day when they were set 
against the need of a person who needed to be healed on the Sabbath. In that, he revealed the heart of God, which is not interested in stained stained glass windows, which we don't have in this beautiful facility. Uh, We don't have an organ, so we don't have organ solos. But we do have congregational hymns or songs or even pastoral prayers. Half as much as what God really cares about is producing love-filled homes, generous hearts, and spirit-filled lives, right? That's what the whole, really the end part of chapter 5 and chapter 6 are talking about, the spirit-filled life. That's what God cares about. I mean, is it nice to hear a a wonderful choir sing some beautiful song, have a quote-unquote time of worship? That's nice, but God doesn't care half as much about that as He does that I love my neighbor who does not know God. And that my home is not a place of fighting and strife, but it's a place of love and respect and and where God is at. Those are the things that God really cares about. The conclusion of the book is of Ephesus, uh, the conclusion here, verses 10 to 20, is so important that we're going to take several Sundays to dive into it. It's the armor of God section, right? Maybe you've heard that before, you're familiar with it. And my boys had this like plastic armor of God set. It was like the helmet, the belt, the shield, the breastplate of righteousness, the shin things, the feet, that all. And we recently gave it away. Or got rid of it or something. We had it for years and years and years. Oh, if I could have just held on to it a little longer, I would have wore it each Sunday. But I don't have any of you have a set like that. Let me know afterwards and I'll, I'll wear it. Uh, but it is it's so important because we are living in this spiritual war, right? This, this spiritual warfare. We don't necessarily see it most of the time because we're not looking for it. Or we're, when we think of spiritual warfare, we think of, you know, we think of like, I don't know, Twilight Zone or whatever it is, you know, I don't know. That you probably don't even know what Twilight Zone is, but when I was growing up, it was like this TV show, you know. Maybe uh, Harry Potter or whatever, Twilight, you know, whatever. But what happens is it's so important and yet it's so often underemphasized. I know it's been unemphasized in my time here in the last five years. We haven't talked a lot about it. Or it's misunderstood or it's just plain ignored. And so here's the one verse really we're going to emphasize here this morning. He starts out uh, this end section, this conclusion to the book, and he says, finally... Be strong. Everybody flex something. Urgh, even make a sound. Urgh. I mean, you can just flex your leg. You don't have to, you know. Be strong, right? Be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Everybody say, Urgh. Okay, so now that's like physical, but we're going to apply this to what Paul is actually talking about. So he says, finally, and so this is now his setup for, for the rest. It's like he's saying now, for, for the rest of what I'm talking about, be strong. And this is a little tricky to understand, right, the, the translation in English, be strong. It's a, it's a middle passive uh, verb, right? So it's, it's pa- what does passive mean? I'm teaching my sons to be real men. And we have four, a four-part definition, and the first part is to reject passivity. And they all have to do with the contrast between Adam and Jesus. So Adam said, oh God, it was her. right? And so from the very beginning of human creation, uh, man has a tendency to be passive. right? And Jesus was the antithesis of being passive. It doesn't mean aggressive, right? <laughs> That's a word some of you are familiar, right? Passive, aggressive. But the opposite of passive is not aggressive, it's initiative. So Jesus took initiative. Jesus didn't wait for you know, someone to call on him. He didn't wait for someone to say, uh, can you please uh, put a robe on and serve us and wash our feet? You know, no, Jesus said, guys, I want you to sit around. I'm going to love and serve you. He was not aggressive, but he took initiative. So I'm trying to teach my sons that. But there are certain things, this is where it gets a little tricky, we're kind of wired to be passive or aggressive, not necessarily take initiative, at least as men. But this this idea of being strong has in part the idea that God is doing something and we are allowing Him or we're coming to Him for something. So 
He is giving us the strength. We're being strong in the Lord, but it's His strength that is coming upon us. So we're not doing something to get strong. We're allowing Him to give us strength, but we're going to Him for that strength. Now we're going to have to unpack what does that mean? What does that look like? And we'll get to that. But it's allowing the Lord to strengthen you and strengthening yourself, but strengthening yourself in the Lord. It's the Lord who provides the power in both cases. Power is such a major theme of Paul's prayer and his desire for the church. Now, whenever I talk to people about power, I, I had a, a lot of experience in my early years of being a Christian, being around friends and churches that were kind of charismatic. And I'm not in any way uh, talking down on them. I have some wonderful friends that are part of charismatic churches and, and so on and so forth and partnerships and all that. Um, but I'm, I'm not charismatic. Our, our church is not charismatic. And I don't mean like I'm a charismatic kind of guy, you know, like uh, this kind of thing. You know, I'm not talking about that. But, yeah, but from a theological perspective, you know, like we don't... At least I've never experienced in our church anyone speaking in tongues or like supernatural kind of things like that. Although I'm pro-supernatural because I think there's some supernatural things that are going on right now. Anyway, won't get into all that uh, right now. But when Paul, the apostle, teaches the church about power, he is not talking about those kinds of things. And he doesn't ever talk about power in the light of those kinds of things. He talks about power in this way. Listen to these two passages. You've heard them before uh, in the series here in Ephesians. But notice these two prayers and notice how he talks about power. So starting in verse 18 of chapter 1, he says, I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope which has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is like the working of his mighty strength. Three words for power being used there that he uses here in these three words in Ephesians 6.10. Which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him far above the heavenly realms. Far above all rule of authority and dominion and every title that can be given not only in the present age but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church. So here, the power that he's talking about here is what? The power that raised Jesus from the dead. Well, that's pretty awesome and supernatural, right? And Paul prayed in Philippians chapter 3 that I might know the power of his resurrection, right? But notice what he says in chapter 3, verses 16, when he says, I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through His Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints. Power for what? Notice what he says. To grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. So here, clearly, the power is both to grasp how much God loves us and to have that love for people. And so I think, in my experience, the most awesome manifestation of the power of God has been in someone who is a hater, not like... Cowboys fans and Redskins fans. But much deeper than that. Like people who hate each other because of ethnic history, right? Racism and, and things like that, where they go from this hatred to now loving each other, just like Paul, who hated the Gentiles and hated the Christians. He turned into a man who it says that he was like a father and like a mother in his deep love. And it says that he so loved them, he was in birth pain. Galatians chapter 4 says he was in birth pain until Jesus be formed in their lives. And so that's like serious commitment. That is the power of God working in and through Paul to change him to become a lover of people. So power, this is a major theme of the book of Ephesians and the Apostle Paul. And I think the core evidence of that power is love. So here he's saying, finally, 
Be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. And he's going to talk about how we do spiritual warfare. What kind of ammunition, what kind of uh, uh, materials do we need? And we're going to get into that in two weeks. There are three words for power in this verse. Be strong in His mighty power or in His powerful strength. I mean, He didn't have to say, you know, use these words, but he, he adds them on top of each other in his powerful strength. And it reminds us that God's power is available for us against the forces we face. The forces that you face this week, God's power is sufficient. God's power is a powerful strength. It's an over-powerful strength. God's strength is overpowering the strength of any other power and any other, any other strength. So what circumstance are you facing that requires powerful spiritual strength? And, and you might have to think about this, for some of you, more than others. For some, it's very obvious. For others, you're living in your own strength so much that you don't, you're, you're not seeing your own need even. What temptations are you facing and giving into? There's a guy that I met uh, just through Twitter. And we started having this conversation. And he started opening up to me a little bit more, a little bit more. And he's, he's training. He's in school. He, he's in the Army. But he's also in seminary to uh, become a, a, an Army chaplain. And so he's already been kind of having this kind of ministry. And he opened up to me about some of the struggles he was having a few weeks ago. Just kind of more on the surface. And probably just to see kind of what my response would be. And then he tells me, like, a week ago, last week, that he's, he's going to be moving up here. He's down in the south, and he's going to be moving up here uh, to be with some family for a little while and get a job. He used to work on Capitol Hill for a while, years ago. He's still a young guy. He's, he's, I think he's only 28. But uh, at any rate, he opened up to me uh, to the specific details and extent of his troubles. And he, he said to me, he said, I'm just totally alone. Like, I cannot do this. And I, and I wrote back to him, and I gave, sent him some resources, and I said, I, I'm, not really, I'm not really equipped, and, and you know, I, I have my own struggles, and so I, I don't want to dive into this one-on-one -on -one with you, but here are some resources, and I'll help you, and we can get together and move up and all that. And he wrote me back, and he said, no, I, I really am. I, I, I'm alone. Like, you know. And I said, well, let me, you know, See, our real enemy wins when we're in isolation. And when we feel like we're in isolation, sometimes we're not, but we feel like we are. Sometimes we are, we put ourselves in that place. And one of the resources I sent him, I said to him, look, this is so serious that you might have to check yourself into a, an inpatient kind of thing. Like where you move and get professional help. Like if you really want to get out of this, because his struggles are quite severe, like serious addiction. So maybe some of you feel, not necessarily like you know you have this tremendous addiction, but you, but you feel alone. And it could be in part that you've made choices long enough to put yourself in this isolated kind of world. And in, to get, in order to get out of it, in order to live in the spiritual power that Paul's talking about, you might have to take some radical steps that involve vulnerability. Because ultimately... Paul says we are strong. God's strength you know, enters us when we are weak and vulnerable. And it's in those places. You know, James says, confess your sins to one another so that you can be healed. So there's this context for spiritual power. But it isn't like God's going to zap you one-on-one. -on -one. He's got this power just to give you. That's not at all how it works. What habits or even addictions have you been shackled to? Anger or bitterness or pride. Maybe you've just been trying on your own. You've just been living your own life. Maybe it's lust. Maybe even gluttony. And you hide it really well because it's not obvious that you are. Maybe it's video games. Man, I, I, this just popped into my head. I, I'm not equating this problem with Michael, but if, did anyone see his Facebook? If, you, if you're on with Mike, you've got to go to his Facebook page. Please, please make fun of him. There's a picture of him with his ankle up and, like, ice on it. 
and it says that he twisted his ankle uh, dancing last night. It's pretty hilarious. It's pretty hilarious. I can imagine that just a small dance move from Michael could be harmful to his health. So, uh, you know, but anyway, I say that because, you know, video games was a real serious issue for Michael. And, uh, but he, he took it seriously, you know, I think. He's working on it and, and walking with the Lord in that way. Maybe it's loneliness. Maybe it's frust Maybe you're frustrated, and, and in that frustration, you just don't feel like you have spiritual strength enough. Maybe there's uncertainty, certainly for Laura and I. That's, that's true. Maybe there's trouble. Maybe there's sickness. You know, talk to Matthew today. His grandma's been kind of in and out of the hospital, in the hospital right now. Pretty serious. Or just weakness. God has the power that we need in any of these kind of situations. He has powerful strength, but many of us struggle to experience that power when we need it most, right? Like, I know, I I can't say, man, wait, if you said, hey, Ed, how was your week? Like, how spiritually powerful did you feel this week? You know, like, if, if someone asked you, if, if you had to fill out a form, how spiritually powerful, would you just be like, ah, yeah, I was a beast, beast mode, you know, spiritually. You know, I went to this Redskin Combine thing yesterday. I went to Redskins Park and competed in this Combine thing yesterday I, that I won on the radio. I was the ninth caller. It's pretty awesome. So Elijah and I went down. Maybe if you saw, I posted a picture. Chris Cooley came out, and I, Elijah got a picture with him. We were talking to him for a little while. For you old school Redskin fans, uh, one of the competitions of the, of the uh, Combine was kicking field goals. And the coach for kicking the field goals was Mark Mosley. Uh, he's like the only kicker in the Hall of Fame. And, uh, but he had uh, his Super Bowl ring on right there. It was kind of cool. I was just chatting. You know, like, you're one of my heroes, you know. And, uh, and, and I did pretty well, you know, like for an old guy, you know. And I was talking to this guy. So, so when we walk in, just tell a quick story. So we, when we walk in, I was in the second wave. So there was two waves. So one wave of people had already gone. Second wave of people go in. And so uh, the guy comes over, Chuck Sapienza. So Sports Talk 980, and if you listen to Sports Radio, all those guys were here because they were there. So Chuck comes over, and there's like 30 of us there. He's like, all right, how many, anybody going to do the 40 in under 5-3? Now, you got to understand, this is like guys that are my age, okay, and, you know, some younger, some older. Just adults, right? And so I'm thinking, in my head, I'm thinking, I have no idea how fast I could run, you know, but I'm thinking, 5'3", all right? And I hope I can still do that, you know, but I didn't say anything. And so nobody says anything. He says, all right, the fastest time today so far is 5'3". And so I'm thinking, oh, I got this. I got this. You know, I want to be like the fastest. I'm like dreaming, you know. And so then we go over, and I don't, I don't, I didn't notice the guy in front of me. So I go, and I mean, it's like totally cold. Like, there's no warm up. You just, just, you know, and so totally cold, go, and I run. And I did a, and I did a 5 2. And the guy was like, the guy doing the timing, he's like, oh, he's like, man, that's one of the fastest times today. Awesome, awesome. So then I go over to the, the throw, right? And I'm like, I'm going to bomb this, right? So then I'm talking to this guy behind me, I'm like, hey, how'd you do it? And he looked like an athlete. And he's like, I did a 5 flat. So I was like, well, how old are you? <laughs> And he's like, 27. I'm like, yes. You know? Said you, and he was a track star, like in high school, you know? And, and I was like, so I bet that's, you like fell off pretty bad. And he's like, oh, yeah, this is slow. And I was like, well, yeah, you know? And I didn't want to, I said, well, I didn't run track or anything, you know? But I've been out of high school for 20 years, <laughs> young man, you know? It was kind of cool. We had a good conversation. And then he went back and then ran it like 4 9, whatever. And I didn't do it again. But, uh, you know, there's always somebody that's faster. There's always somebody that's stronger. There's always somebody that's better. There's always somebody that's worse and weaker, you know. And so when we think about comparing ourselves, it's so difficult to see ourselves the right way, right? Like here I am, you know, I ran a 5-240. Like linemen in the NFL run it that fast, you know. So like if you're talking about, you know, like being fast in terms of the NFL, that's not very fast. But everyday guys on the street, like, like I'm going to walk around the mall today going, yeah, I ran a 5-2-40, what's up? Like, who cares about that? Nobody cares about that, except for like Elijah. He's still a little bit impressed with that. 